All right, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everybody all over the world. We are coming to you live at 11 o'clock Central Time. So let's get started today. Sorry, my hair is a little bit in my face today. Uh, so we are going to start at the top of the hour, and we're just going to wait a couple of minutes to get a bunch of people flooding into uh, this live stream. So once this uh, goes out to everyone. I look forward to talking with you uh, on the chat and answering any of your particular questions that you have in um, in your particular career search, because everyone is a little bit different. Although there are some major trends that I'd like to share with you and also um, some ideas on how to prepare for a high stakes interview, possibly even a final interview in less than 20 minutes. So I'm hoping to really share that with you and uh, get your uh, get your feedback on that. So these are these are questions that you need to be able to answer in an interview. So we're going to cover basically answering strategy in an interview. Now, of course, there's questioning strategy. There's a lot of other strategies, rapport building strategy. There's a lot of things that have to happen ahead of time to prepare you for those. Um, but today we're going to talk about answering strategy. So we're going to get started in. Well, it is 11 o'clock central. So we'll go ahead and get started now. So. Uh, Thank you very much, everyone, for coming today. I'm Tammy Cabell with Career Resume Consulting, and I look forward to sharing all of this information with you today. Uh, today, I've got a, a, it's an interesting PowerPoint presentation that I'm going to share with you. And it's interesting because it's much shorter, but it's packed with content. I'm not saying there's a ton of words, but um, there's a lot of really good content that you're going to want to pick up from the the handouts toward the end of the hour. So the handout is going to be this um, slideshow that I'm going to show you that actually has how to put off the negotiation conversation. Because as you have probably experienced in your job search, there are some players like recruiters that like to ask you, what are your salary requirements? How much are you making now? We're going to be able to push that off so that they are the ones anchoring the dollar amount and not you. And I can tell you that um, this is going to be super important for you if you're wanting to make a big move up in your career or you are underemployed now or unemployed, but you're making less than what the market is paying for your skill set, for the scope of your responsibilities that you've done. And if you have any questions about your marketability, you can always contact us and schedule some time with my husband or myself and, and we can talk about your personal marketability. But today we're going to go through ways that you can boost that so that if you're being paid less than market wage, you can actually get above market wage. Um, it has resulted in, in uh, 2020, 20, yes, last year, 2020, we were able to get on average, I believe, around $112,000 more in total compensation for our clients versus what they were getting in their last job. And um, that's a little over 51% uh, increase from what they were making before. Some people actually uh, doubled their compensation. Actually, many of them did. However, I need to tell you that um, I can't guarantee that I can make you $112,000 more uh, on average. Everyone is different. There's a lot of factors that go into that marketability. And so I can tell you if you've been at one place for a long time, you tend to be uh, underpaid. Because if you're getting only zero to three percent each um, year, that's that's really not a big increase. But if you're moving one place, if you're able to get fifty percent more, it's going to make up for those years that you did not get much of an increase. All right. So, uh, all right. Let us go ahead and get started. I'm going to go ahead and start the slideshow. So, give me just a second to get going. And Put your questions in the chat, and then and let me um, let me make sure that my phone is silenced. Give me just a moment. That way, it doesn't disturb us. But I do. Uh, or sorry, um, Lacey will be sending me your questions. So we've got Brian, my husband, on the line to answer your questions, as well as our two head coaches. We've got. Um, Clay, where's our COO, and also Philip in UK, um, who leads our UK and EU division, as well as um, he's our, our uh, head branding coach as well. So um, 
If you have questions that come up for you as I'm going through this conversation today, put them down in the chat and we will either answer them in the chat or um, we could send those just, um, you could say even if you want Tammy to answer, just a question for Tammy and then Lacey can send me that and I can answer that at the toward the end of the hour. So let's go ahead and get started. Hope you can see me okay. All right, so we are talking today about preparing for a high stakes interview in under 20 minutes. You know, a lot of you are very uh, busy, just like me. And, you know, sometimes it's hard to think about preparing for an interview. So let's talk about why this is important. And let me make sure that it uh, looks good as it's tumbling along. So um, it's important because I'm going to give you a story back when I was a teenager. Uh, during my junior year, I took the ACT test. I didn't know you could study for the ACT exam. So I just showed up and took it. And I only found out two years later, as I was in college, that had I gotten one more point on the ACT test, which is like the SAT, only kind of in the Midwest. And um, if I would have gotten one more point, I would have had a full ride scholarship um, all four years to any state college in Missouri. I didn't realize that. I had no idea. You know, I went to public school, didn't have, I'm, I'm not saying, you know, we were destitute or anything, but I didn't have a good counselor in high school. They didn't tell me. My parents hadn't gone to college, so they didn't know to tell me. And so they, they didn't even know anything about the ACT. So I'm saying this because there's so many times that people just wing it and assume that it's going to go really well. They don't know that there are things that you can do in a hiring process to actually prepare and get better at the way that you answer questions, as well as the questions that you ask them, which ends up being more important. But the way you answer questions are is, is very, very important. So we're gonna go through what's the best answering strategy and how do you prepare for a, uh, a, a high stakes interview where you might be talking with a lot of different people over the course of one day on video, or you may be talking with a panel of people over the course of, you know, a, an hour to two hours. And so you really want to make sure that you know exactly what stories you're going to tell. You know exactly how you're going to answer specific questions. So I've boiled it down to five questions you need to be able to answer. And if you're able to come up with the answers specific to this particular hiring process, possibly even specific to the person that you're interviewing with, then you're actually going to do much, much better head and shoulders above everyone else that's answering questions, okay? So that's why this is so important because there are some things that you can do very quickly to get grounded in this particular hiring process with this particular position, this particular hiring manager, in other words, the decision maker, as well as every stakeholder that you're going to be talking to, including gatekeepers like HR and recruiters, all right? Uh, okay, so then we're going to go through those five questions that you're going to want to prepare for, for your next interview and every interview after that. Okay, so let me actually move over. Let's go to the top, shall we? All right, so keep in mind, if we back up 30,000 foot, the goal of the interview is that you are seen as three things. They're the most competent, you're the most relevant to their pain points and their aspirations as a company and the hiring manager specifically. And also you're the most likable because people hire people that they like over people that are more qualified. So the competency piece, let's take a moment to talk about that. The competency piece is done through great branding. In other words, what they want to know is, can you do the job? Can you do the responsibilities of the job? Have you been there, done that? Are you giving me that been there, done that feeling that I can trust you getting up to speed very quickly, making a contribution quickly, paying for yourself and having that personal ROI in the first year? So are you gonna pay for yourself first year? That They, they do wanna know that and hopefully pay for yourself many times over. Um, and competency has a lot to do with how much they offer you at the end of the hiring process if you're the chosen one. It's because um, with competency, they do get the feeling of that trust piece and that trust piece is very important. They want to know you can do the job. Then probably more important emotionally 
is the relevancy to that company and the relevancy to that position. So if I'm a hiring manager, there are specific things that I'm wanting to solve, some pain points that I have, those are masked as challenges. They're masked as fires that I constantly have to put out but never seem to go away. And I want those to go away. I want you to come in and be able to handle my specific problems. So be thinking about what are the relevant, relevant pain points that you can find by doing research online with the person, with the company to figure out what it is that, that they need to hear that makes you their chosen person. Now, I'm not saying that you're going to say something that isn't true. What you're trying to do is build that map that has a straight line between your experience and what they're looking to solve for, what their aspirations are, and that goal that you can help them get to, okay? So think about relevancy in terms of what you've done in the past that maps directly to what they want you to do and what that means is that you need to ask the right questions. You do need to ask in the first 15 minutes, what is the biggest challenge that you're trying to overcome? Or you could even say, if I were to take on this role, what would be the biggest challenge that I would be faced with in the first six to 12 months? That tells you, when they answer that, that tells you what it is that is the biggest thing. And it probably isn't on the job description. So if you ask, what is the challenge that I'm going to be anticipating, it might be specific to your experience because you may not have experience in that industry. You may not have experience with that type of product or service, whatever it might be. And that's okay. You just want to show that you've done something similar. And keep in mind that if you say it's similar, it's going to appear similar in their heads as well. So if you say, you know, I, I actually do have some similar experience. I remember when I was, and then you go into a story about how you've done something similar. May not it may not be exactly the same, but even if just a piece of it is similar, 20%, then you can really expand on that 20% so that you're talking about things that they understand. It's like, okay, yeah, he can do that. She can do that. So that, you know, they can, they can do this job with their eyes closed. That's not a problem. And they're exactly who we need to solve our problems. They're exactly the bridge that's going to take us to where we need to be. That's you, what you want them thinking. Now let's talk about likability. That is the importance of building rapport when you're talking at the beginning of an interview. So with every single person that you're interviewing with, you want to make sure that you have a great opener that might be either uh, a commonality between the two of you. That's That would be my number one piece of advice is look for a commonality. Maybe they went to the same university that your daughter's going into, or maybe you guys worked completely different areas and locations, but uh, maybe you worked at the same company 20 years ago. Short stint, short stint, yeah, but there's a commonality there. And then you can say, yeah, I, I'm an ex-cognizant person myself. And, and then there's, there's a feeling of camaraderie. Oh yeah, you've been through the same thing I've been through. So that's important as well. Uh, so you want to be seen as the most competent, the most relevant, and the most likable, of course. And, and uh, if you have any questions, put those in chat. All right, so there's also the KLT factor, which I guarantee you haven't heard me say, except you may know it as the know, like, and trust factor. So you want to make sure that the interviewer, that the decision maker needs to feel like that, you, that he or she knows you, likes you, and trusts you. Now we get into that likes again, it's worth repeating twice because again, people hire people that they like. And if you've done, if you've done hiring, you know that to be the truth. You know that you've hired somebody that you wanted to work with above someone that had an extra degree or um, more, ex more years of experience. You just want to hire somebody that you like. Trust is going to be really important, though, too. So they need to feel like they know you authentically, not just what you don't want to sound like you're just saying whatever they want to hear. You want to be authentic to who you are. At the same time, you want to be relevant to what they need. And so you want to take the pieces from your experience that are relevant to what they need and go from there and tell a story about how you've achieved something similar. Okay. All right. All right. Let us get into the interview. We're going to start going through the five interview questions. Okay. So 
Magical five questions, their origin. I, I did cover that earlier in the hour. So uh, these are questions where I took 206 questions, got it down to five, really distilled it down. And actually they were, I think I started with 12, brought it down to seven, then I brought it down to five. I'm really happy with these five. And I've used these ever since probably 2011 is when I um, uh, really solidified these five. And so I've just been building upon them uh, from, from 2011, 10 years ago. So let's, um, I'm gonna go down to the bottom. Give me just a second. Let's see, hold on just a second. There we go, there we go. All right, I made myself smaller. All right, why are you here? That's the first question. In other words, why did you apply for this position? Um, why do you want this position? Why are we talking? Um, so why, what is it about this position, about this company, and about this industry that gets you excited, enthusiastic, um, just any kind of positive emotion that you can show that is very specific to describing what it is about the position you love, what it is about the company you love. I'm gonna even add one after industry, and that is the hiring manager. Why would you want to be led by that person? What is it about that person that you like, whether it's something that they said that resonated with you, or it's something that you researched prior, you may have gone to YouTube and looked them up on YouTube. I would give their name followed by the company name. See if anything comes up because they could have done a speaking engagement at a conference that's on YouTube. They could have done um, an article. Uh, they could have actually been um, in the paper or the business journal where they have been uh, interviewed by someone. So they've been quoted. You can find that kind of stuff out on on everywhere from uh, Google to um, YouTube to even the social media sites, other social media sites like uh, Facebook, Twitter, all of those things. You wanna make sure that you do a broad sweep of everything when you're doing research to find out what it is about that person that makes you wanna work there and, and makes you wanna work for them. So the position specific, when you're talking about it, just make sure that during the interview that you get across to them what it is about the position that you really love. So if there's one specific thing that you really, I, this makes it the perfect job for me. The fact that it stays at home, I always want a job that I can work from home from for years to come. And uh, it, that's that's the biggest benefit for me. Or and, and something else too. Notice I have the word personal reason on here. That's very important. So you want the personal reason and I want to even use the word selfish because you have a tendency in an interview to always try to build your value to them. And what you don't wanna get into on this particular question, because you've got four other questions in which you can build your value, not a problem. This one needs to be very selfish to you because there is always a fear from a hiring manager. And if you've hired, you would agree that there is always a fear that someone may leave very soon after you hire them, that you've made a bad hire. It makes you look bad as a person. So the hiring manager is afraid of being seen as a fool if they hire someone that leaves in 60 days. So they wanna make sure that you're going to be a great cultural fit for them. They also wanna know um, what you can do for them. But the biggest thing is, why do you want the job? Why, why will you stay here forever, right? So let let them know what specifically it is about the position, about the company, about the hiring manager, about the industry, if you're changing industries. If you're not changing industries and you're just moving from one financial services company to another, then all you have to do is um, talk about the company and the position and the, the leader and not necessarily the industry because you're already an industry insider. So you want to give specific examples of why you love this job, why this would be perfect for you. What about the company really gets you excited and especially around the future. And it's a different industry about the future of the industry. What is it about this industry that gets you excited? And it only has to be one small thing. It doesn't have to be everything. It's just one or two key things that make you really love this job. And you want to convey that to someone proactively rather than, um, 
just using it as as just an answer. So th these are questions to answer in your preparation, but feel free to take any of the stories that you want to tell, anything that you want to say proactively, especially around your guiding principles, your your corp perfect corporate culture. So give that information out proactively, and that's going to land so much better than if they say, um, are you someone of high integrity? And you say, oh, definitely, yes. That's that's not going to go over well. So make sure that uh, that you can answer why are you here, very specific to you and the position, the company, the leader, and the industry. Okay. All right. Question number two: What can you do for us? Now, this question is the meat and potatoes of what you've been able to do for companies in the past. So you want to tell stories. My formula for a perfect a perfect answer to an interview question is that you start with a general statement, usually one sentence, possibly two. And in that sentence, you're basically going to say, yeah, you know, actually, I've been doing that on a weekly basis for the last six years. In fact, then you go into a story. So, so you start general like that. And then you end with, you know, it reminds me of a time when uh, about, um, Oh, five years ago, or you don't even have to say that it just reminds me of a time when I was working at such and such a company where I had this problem and this is how I overcame that problem or challenge. And then, um, this is what I was able to do with that opportunity is I, you know, really exceeded the customer's expectations and I was able to, da, 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 da. so there you go. So there's your, you want to have the achievement story end in a quantifiable result. If you can quantifiable result doesn't have to be money. It can be. The amount of time that it took, maybe you were able to automate a process and it saves some man hours. Maybe you were able to um, change a process so that it takes less hours but gets the same result, even if it wasn't manual to automate it. And it could be uh, really anything in your career history that I'm going to go back to mapping that straight line between your experience and what they need. So tell those stories and prepare those ahead of time. I like to use a variation on the star format, situation, task, action, result. I like a SOAR format, S-O-A-R, with the O being the opportunity that it presented you. So if you ever come across a challenge, if you, let's say that you come onto the scene and um, there, there was an initiative of getting you know, saving $12 million in operations, for instance, and you were able to do it, but there were a lot of challenges that you had to uh, overcome along the way because you are the protagonist. You're telling a story just like you're the protagonist in a an epic venture. So think about the challenges you had to overcome, the opportunity that it presented to you. In other words, it gave you the opportunity to exceed a customer's expectations, to save $12 million. It gave me the opportunity to um, a lot of things. So think about what that opportunity is. And that way, pretty soon, they are trained to understand that you see every challenge or, or problem as an opportunity to make a difference, okay? Uh, so always have stories ahead of time, put them on a cheat sheet. And if, you, if this is the first time that you've been uh, on one of these live streams, I'll tell you the cheat sheet is very simple, couple of words. Uh, to remind you of a story, just as glancing at it, followed by a quantifiable result. And, and then list every one of those that you want to talk about. And I would say about 12 to 15. I know with our clients, we, we really strive for 15 to 20 stories over the course of an entire hiring process, which means that you can use different stories for different people. And when they get together and talk about you, everybody's bringing up different examples of how you are exactly what they're looking for. Okay. All right. Let us go on to question three, that, shall we? Question three, will you fit in with our values and culture? So this is what I'm talking about as far as guiding principles. If you are someone of high integrity, even if you're in sales, I, I'm just, I give salespeople a hard time. Uh, but let's say integrity is super important to you. So you wanna proactively state that because if that's important to the hiring manager, they're gonna be super, super impressed with you. They're really going to be attracted to you if you have the same values and corporate culture that they do. So go ahead and proactively tell them what's important to you as far as how you work, how you do business. And that way, 
when it's proactive, it's coming from the heart and it's authentic. If you just agree with what they ask, that's not authentic. And, and even though you may truly believe whatever they're asking, doesn't mean that they're going to be convinced of it. Okay. So the right employer, that's what you're looking for. You're looking for a, a company that will check all of your boxes, a role that will check all of your boxes, a leader that you respect and you would love to work for, as well as a company that you'd love to work for. All right. Okay, question four out of five. How are you different than other people that, may we talk, that we may talk with? So this comes down to your brand. And when we put together a brand for somebody, we do so after looking at their entire career history. And what we're picking out are trends in their experience. So what have you done over and over again that has made a consistent a consistently impressive difference to the companies that you've worked for in the past or the company that you're working for right now. Write those things down. You want to bring up your three core strengths. So determine what those three core strengths are. And I'd like to uh, give you a little bit more instruction on that. When we come up with the three core strengths, what we're looking for is an intersection. Really, if you think of like a Venn diagram, and I know I didn't put this on the, um, the, the, um, the question here, but think of a Venn diagram as you've got who you are and how you do business. We want to authentically be able to answer that for them and let them know who you are. But also your differentiators, when you compare yourself to other people that may be in the running for that job. Now, when people are working with us, they don't have competition usually. So they don't have open hiring processes. Most of the time they are um, talking with an employer where there is no competition and they get a job created that wasn't available before. So um, you don't have to worry about the differentiation so much unless they've tried to hire for it in the past and they weren't successful. But you do want to show how you are different than other people that would be comparable to you. Uh, and then, and, and that's where having it like a career firm like ours really helps because you can, we know what your competition looks like because we've worked with your competition. So uh, we know how you're different than everyone else. The, the third piece is really the intersection of um, not only who you are, how you do business, and how you're different than your competition. But then thirdly, uh, what makes you attractive to an employer who's looking to hire somebody like you or looking to hire for that role? So generally speaking, people will hire people where they very easily see that they can solve their biggest problems. Pain points are a big motivator for people. Uh, just from a psychological standpoint, pain drives us more than pleasure or the avoidance of pain. So if, if they're in pain because they're, um, you know, they just, something is broken. If you can say, oh yeah, I fixed that before. I, it would probably take me about three or four months to get that done. Absolutely. They're not going to hire you for the three or four months. They want somebody that can continue to make these fires go away so they don't have to put them out anymore. That's what you can show them is what is it? What are the three things that will describe how you do business? Will describe what your biggest accomplishments are? Um, and that would be different than everyone else. I'll give you a really good example. I'll go back to salespeople. A lot of salespeople want one of their core strengths to be relationship building. But unless you can show, I built this relationship, which allowed me to call in this favor, which allowed me to close this particular piece of business, unless you've got that very easy straight line between the dollar amount and relationship building, even if you're in sales, I wouldn't say that's probably one of your three core strengths because that's not, that's not the reason that they're, they're not buying your services or hiring you because of your relationship building. It's got to be more concrete than that. So it could be um, immense top line revenue growth. Maybe you've had a, 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 you know, you're just able to make things grow and, uh, and scale. It depends on what size company, if you're looking at, I would say under 250 million, you should probably use the word scale. If you're using above 250 million, say growth. Um, it, it just, just little nuances like that help. Now let's get to the really big one. How much will you cost? So I've got, I've got actually some script words of five different answers that you can give to this 
And the other question, which is um, how much are you making right now? What's your salary? So of course, there's going to be salary requirements asked of you in first conversations many times, mostly through recruiters. However, uh, an employer also wants to know, like a decision maker, if you're reaching out to a decision maker, they want to know, are we even in the same ballpark? Should I waste my time talking to you because you're way too expensive or you're way too cheap? Um, mostly they're worried about you being too expensive. And that's the way it should be. Uh, and so they want to know if they can afford you. So they will ask, so how much, how much are you going to cost me or how much, uh, what are your salary requirements? So let's talk about the different ways that you can approach the answer to that, because there's a lot of things that you can do. Mostly what you want to do is deflect talking about compensation until after they've offered you the job, because their commitment to having you as their solution, once they've decided that you're the one they want, it's just a matter of what it's going to take to get you, they will pay a lot more for you as an expert and as that solution to their biggest pain points and also their aspirations, if you can make yourself relevant to both of those. Um, if they like you, they want to work with you, usually the hiring process takes as little as two to three weeks, many times. So once you find that right fit, then it's just a matter of let me get everybody I know to, to talk with you within the next couple of weeks, and then I'll make an offer. So um, here are some of the ways that you can come up with deflecting and getting them to anchor a dollar amount, because it really shouldn't matter what you're making now, what you expect to make. It really matters of what is market paying for this position with these responsibilities. In other words, if you are making a big move up, a lot of our clients go from director to C-suite. So if they're going from director to C-suite, we need to, to show that, um, that it's the, the apples to oranges comparison as far as what they were making before they were a director. They weren't in the C-suite. So they're not going to be making the same. It is really apples to oranges. I'll get to that in a moment. Um, let's see. Let me, uh, go up top. Here we go. All right. Let's talk about the magic phrases to defect, to flect the compensation discussion. So. Here are the, the next five slides, including this one, are uh, what it is that you should say if um, they ask you, what are your salary requirements? So, you know, I'm sure that we can come to an agreement on money once both of us have decided that I'm a great fit for the team. You know, or if, you, if it's a leadership role, maybe you say leadership team. And I, you know, I don't want money to stand in the way of a great position that's going to allow me a big impact or, or the ability to make a big impact. Uh, so that would be probably the first thing, um, although I've got a couple of other things here. So you would want to use the one that most fits your situation, okay? This other one that I've got here says, well, you know, I'm fortunate enough right now to be choosy on where I land next. And having a great fit and my ability to make a huge impact, uh, the great fit really is um, an important priority. It's really the first priority for me. And my ability to make a big impact or a huge impact is a close second. If those two things happen, I'm sure we can agree on compensation because that's really my third. Um, so uh, it, as long as it's a great fit and I feel like I could be successful in this role, I'm sure we can come to an agreement on compensation. I'm not going to let money stand in the way of a great opportunity. That's what you say. Now that may seem Here's what that seems to them. I will tell you what it seems to our clients is, well, does that sound a little bit desperate when you say, I'm sure we can come to an agreement on compensation. Money's not going to stand in the way. When you say that, though, the way that they perceive it is they're not particularly money motivated. They're more motivated around the outcomes that they can produce in the job and being a part of the team. So there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. It's actually very collaborative and it's good to hear, especially when you're talking money, you're talking compensation, you have to work collaboratively. You cannot negotiate compensation like you do a, a hostage release. It has to be um, very warm and very collaborative. You're working on the same side of the desk as the hiring manager. And it could be, can we work together to get to this number or close to this number? Do you think that the board would allow that? Do you think that um, the shareholders will be okay with that, whatever it might be. You just want to make sure that um, that the compensation will be something that we can collaborate on later. I just want to make sure that that it's a great fit and I can make a big difference. Okay, so then 
what are your salary requirements? Oh, I'm not worried about compensation. I wouldn't be talking to you if I didn't have some idea of what you can pay. Do you happen to have a range in mind for this position? In other words, another tactic that really works well is throwing it back on them. And I recommend start with the fit is most important thing to me, followed by making a big impact. I'm sure we can come to an agreement on compensation if those other two things are there. If you put that first and they say, well, but I really need to know what's, you know, what, what are you looking for? So we're in the same ballpark. Well, um, do you have, you could just quickly go into the question. Do you happen to have a range in mind for this position? Let them state the range. You know, I was talking with somebody yesterday and uh, he's going to, I, I believe he, he may start working with us. He just turned down about a month ago. He just turned down an offer from Tesla and it, it appears as though they knew how much he made, even though he didn't state that. Uh, but he he had had some people that he had worked with that were in Tesla, and he got an offer from them. But it was I think it was around six to eight thousand dollars more than what he was making before six to eight, not sixty eight. And so he didn't he didn't want to leave where he had worked for twenty three years because uh, of, of $6,000, you're not gonna do that. So, um, and not only that, but they told him that he'd be working 60 to 70 hours a week. And at that point in his career, he didn't have to do that. Uh, so, so really he, you know, for $6,000 more, why would he um, work 60 to 70 hours, which is what the stated amount was, which means it's probably closer to 70 to 80. And we've worked with people at Tesla who have left Tesla and moved on to other things. And they were working 70 to 80 hours a week or even more over a hundred hours sometimes. Uh, so, you know, it's one of those um, companies out on the West coast that, uh, it, and I think they're moving to Austin, uh, but um, they, uh, they, they expect a tremendous amount of work, a lot of dedication. And of course they reward you with a lot of um, incentive stock right? So uh, a lot of the, the RSUs that are important, the long-term incentive plans. So put it back on them. So you could start with the fit piece and you could also start with, with this, um, you know, I'm not worried about compensation. I'm sure, you know, I, I have an idea of what you can pay. Do you have a range in mind? Just say, say that and have them, um, have them reply to you. That way they are anchor, anchoring the amount. If if you anchor the amount and you don't know how much they were going to pay you, you never know. Because if they're too low, you can always raise it up. I mean, um, uh, the last person that I helped get a job, we negotiated over this past weekend and he accepted on Monday. And um, he, uh, you know, everything worked really well. And uh, he ended up wanting about thirty to $50,000 more it's totally fine. Um, and so we asked for a lot of things along the way in every component of an executive compensation. And this is a much bigger company than he had ever worked for in the past. And so they got a lot, a lot of opportunity to give him a lot more stock um, equity basis points, actually. So we were able to get his, um, his equity increased that minimum, it'll probably pay out in three to five years of anywhere from 850,000 to 2 million, um, which is going to be, I mean, that's his incentive to work really hard there because that way he gets to pay off his house. How awesome is that? And, you know, he's got um, young twin boys and uh, they're going to go to college someday. So that's, that's where the rest of that's going. So keep in mind that a lot of components in salary requirements they may be able to, to pay you more than what you were making in cash, but a lot of times it's the upside potential that will really build your wealth, really build your retirement. And so I always invite you, look at the entire compensation and not just cash. You need enough cash to live off of, absolutely. But if there's any way to defer some of that to a quarterly bonus, an annual bonus, or any kind of long-term incentive like stock basis points uh, or RSUs, if it's a public company, um, get those stock options and start collecting those. And then once those vest, you've got a, a good amount. You've got a large nest egg for you. All right. So um, then again, if if they corner you and you have to get a range, and, and this has never happened with an employer, but it has happened with many recruiters. So recruiters, they can be kind of ruthless and they will say, you know, this 
this conversation is not going any further until I know how much you want to make or how much you're making right now. So you need to let me know. In other words, they're forcing you to give a number. This sometimes happens also if you're applying to something online, which I do not recommend you do. You really should. I mean, LinkedIn is fantastic for executive searching. The LinkedIn job board, not so much. Any job board, not so much. Even the ladders, which is, I was joking about the ladders with somebody yesterday because you don't hear much about ladders anymore. Uh, back when I was, um, before I was in the career field, when I was uh, looking for a job for 12 months, I, I was on the ladders every day and I never got, never got an interview. But, uh, and a lot of people that I've worked with have told me, yeah, I never got an interview with ladders either. So it's just like a job board. It is a job board, just like anything else, even though you pay for it. So if they corner you, I want you to give a very broad range. So you could say, rather than saying, well, my compensation varies and it's a range of, you know, um, $100,000 between one year and the next, um, you that's not going to fly. However, if you give a very specific amount, like 185 to 254, there's a range. That's a good range because it feels more real because it's an odd number. The 185 to 254 sounds real because you're not just making it up like 185 to 250. So um, you could say, I've been exploring a lot of options. And I think the range of the comp in those options is anywhere between 185 and 254. Or you could go, you could go higher. I recommend if you're above 250, for instance, you could go um, 255 to uh, 375. You could actually go bigger than 100,000. And so the more you make, the, more, the wider the range can be. You can go, um, let me think. You do, if you were making five or 600,000, then uh, you would probably want the range around 200,000 so that you could say, for instance, 450 to um, 625, you know, 635, which would be a little bit more um, odd and, and less rounded. All right. So that's, that's kind of the last straw, though. That's your, your last response. If they say, you know, no, we're not, we're not going any farther until you tell me how much you're making or you tell me how much you're wanting and then you go with a very very wide range and th the reason that you want to do that is because they are asking you the the salary requirements or what you're making as a way of filtering you out versus a way of making it work for them okay that's that's really important i'm going to say it again they're wanting to use this early in the process to filter you out so that they can talk with other people that are within their range. You don't want them to do that. You want to be able to build your value so that they see you as the solution, the only solution. And once you do that, they are so willing to pay you what you're worth, even if that is a lot more than what you're making right now, but they will never know how much you're making right now. It has to do with the job responsibilities of that position and what market is paying. We're, we're usually pretty good about getting someone at the 50th to 75th percentile. I say that because on salary.com, which is a really good sal salary calculator, you can actually see the, the bell curve that they do. And we've got the, um, you've got the top, you know, at the top of the bell curve, that's your 50th percentile. We can usually get people on the 50th to 75th if they are highly qualified which usually they are rock stars. So it works out really well. Um, let me let me give you this too, the how much are you currently making? And that's the apples to oranges comparison. So, well, you know, what I'm making now is probably an apples to oranges comparison given the difference in responsibilities with this new position. Do you have a range you're wanting to pay for this position? Throw it back on them. The first person, this is, this is a negotiation axiom, write it down. The first person to mention a dollar amount loses because it's the anchor. And like when, when my client over the weekend wanted 30 to $50,000 more, I actually anchored an amount that was $98,000 more. So that if he got his 30 to 50, the employer or the hiring manager actually thinks that they got a great deal because they think, well, okay, you know, they're making it work on their end. They're tightening their belt. They're making, um, you know, they might be making less than, than what they were making before. And actually, um, there's, there's a lot that goes into 
compensation negotiation that is completely different than the rest of negotiation. So if you've negotiated contracts before, it's actually not the same as negotiating with the person that's going to be your boss for years to come. So make sure that you are always maintaining that relationship, that camaraderie, that collaboration feeling so that it doesn't feel like you're playing poker and you're giving one card away at a time. You do not want to feel that way. So um, every company actually has appreciated the fact that we have negotiated. And it doesn't have to be with, you know, it could be a $120,000 position that we're able to get up to 155 or 160, something like that. So it, it doesn't have to be a multi six figure position in order to negotiate. You should negotiate with any professional position, even if it's under 100,000. All right. So um, that is basically the presentation. Like I told you, there's, I think there's like less than 20 slides on this one instead of the normal 50 to 75. So thank you for um, walking through that with me. It's a little, a little bit more in detail with each slide. And um, I am, um, we're going to put up and Lacey, can you put up, um, uh, Brian's pictures so that people can schedule time with him next week. If, if you want to talk with us about, uh, partnering with us to get you your next job, uh, feel free to schedule a time, uh, with Brian. And, uh, let me see if I can make that happen. Give me just a second. Cool. All right. So, um, you should be able to talk with Brian and click on the blue um, button that says talk with Brian and you will go to his short little application that has just four, four or five questions on it. Uh, should take you a second and then it goes to a meetings link which shows his calendar and then you can choose a convenient time for next week. So um, he has cleared out some time for you in next week's schedule. So if you have specific questions, that came up that don't get answered today, feel free to talk with Brian if you're considering partnering with us in our, our um, programs and the different services that we provide. Here's our email addresses. We got Brian at Career Resume Consulting and anyone else is just their first name at Career Resume Consulting. So everyone else on my team is a CRC uh, address. Mine is beyond job searching. Just a quick story. I did have CRC a long time ago. It had gotten so full and was getting so many emails every day. I kind of shut that one down and started using this one just for direct contact with clients. And I've adopted that as my main email now. So you can always respond. You can get to me directly at Beyond Job Searching, Tammy at Beyond Job Searching, and then Brian at Career Resume Consulting. There's also Lacey, L-A-C-E-Y at Career Resume Consulting, and Philip with one L, and Clay, C-L-A-Y. So you can reach any of us to uh, ask us anything really. And we'd be happy to, uh, to have a conversation with you. So, um, what are your specific challenges? Let me know. And I'm going to go ahead and spend the last 15 minutes or so, uh, answering questions. Let me, um, tell you what, give me just a second. I'm going to stop the slides. There we go. All right. Okay. Let's take a look at, uh, Questions, see if I've got some. All right. You, okay, so um, one of the questions that Lacey sent me was, can you tell them you found so-and-so or something industry about them on their LinkedIn? Yes, absolutely. It is, it is expected that you're going to look at their LinkedIn profile prior to the interview. So don't, don't be, a, we've never had an instance where someone felt like they were being stalked. In other words, a hiring manager is not going to go, wow, that's, that's not appropriate. We've never had that because of course I'm, I'm there to go, okay, what's, what's going to be very specific about this person that has a commonality or a specific, um, flattery that you want to give them. And so we make it very, uh, appropriate for business. So there are things that you can look at on, for instance, Facebook to find out, you know, who they're married to, how many kids they have, um, anything about their personal life, what kind of music they listen to, what kind of car they drive. There's so much out there that you can find. It gives you an idea of who they are, but you don't want to bring up that stuff in an interview. So just make sure that whatever you have is 
interesting but appropriate. Even if you said, for instance, um, I saw this on YouTube. I was watching that speech that you did at the conference three years ago. I saw that on YouTube, and that was fascinating, especially when you said this, 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 and this. That That is exactly what I have said to my teams for the last three years, and I, I completely agree with you. In other words, there's the commonality. I've got the same opinion that you do, and I heard you say it, and I'm proactively telling you that I agree with you on that. So that gives you an idea of who I am and that I'd be a good fit for you. Okay. So then, um, oh boy, personality assessment test. I love this question. Uh, I took a personality assessment test called Workplace Insight and Aptitude Test. I'm very familiar with that test, actually. Um, after submitting a job application, I got a copy of the personality test. What should I do with the personality test? Should I turn my weaknesses into a strength? No. I will answer that right now. No, no. You do not want to turn your weakness into a strength because that's what everyone does. And hiring managers get so irked by that. I know I get irked by it. So don't try to take the greatest weakness and turn it into a strength. Everyone says, well, I'm not a clock watcher and therefore I tend to work too many hours. And now that I'm working from home, I never really stop working. I work so hard. And, and really because of that, I don't have enough work-life balance. So I'm, I'm working on, on get, making that better. No. Don't do that. Don't go there because everybody else goes there. It would be so refreshing if you told them what your true weakness was and then gave them an example of how it blew up in your face. Yeah. And once you give that example of how it blew up in your face, you say, you know, and as a result of that time, I decided to take a class in order to get more time management skills. Or I realized that I have to delegate in order to get things done. Otherwise, I'm not going to be effective. So, Whatever it is that your weakness is, let them know. Isn't that refreshing that you can actually tell them the truth in an interview and they would be surprised by it and delighted by it, even if it's a weakness question? Something else to note, too. There's actually a lot of studies that have shown, and there was, um, I think it was actually a book that I read by Angela Duckworth um, called Grit. And I can't remember where she teaches, but she's a professor at one of the Ivy League schools. And she wrote a... a um, a book that I read many years, a couple of years ago. Uh, it's not that old. And it said um, that when we look at leaders, when we look at other people, if they describe a weakness to us, we see that favorably, actually, because we're showing humility, we're showing, um, we're just making sure that, um, that we're not afraid to call out our weaknesses. That's actually a strength by itself. So, because of the, and then the thing is that when people are surveyed and, and asked later, how do you feel about describing a weakness to someone else? They felt that it was, um, they didn't want to do it. They, they felt like that was, that was too much. Even though anybody else, if a, another person gives you a weakness, you actually like them better. But if you say a weakness in yourself, you don't like that which is quite interesting. And, and so she, she did a pretty large study that showed that, I, I believe it was Angela Duckworth that came up with that. So just know that it's okay to state a weakness. And I, I remember one time when I was talking weaknesses with a client, I said, he, he says, what's your greatest weakness? And I said, well, do you want me to list them alphabetically or chronologically? And he, he laughed and he said, really? Really? You got a lot of weaknesses? And I said, oh yeah. Oh yeah. And I know what they are too. And so I, went on to explain about half a dozen of them. And he said, you know, I am so impressed that you said that because I would have not guessed that you would disclose weaknesses. And I'm like, of course. It shows that you're self-actualized and shows that um, uh, you're, not, you're not afraid of knocking yourself down. That's okay. Uh, it, it shows that everyone's human. Everyone has their limits. No one is perfect. No one can do everything. And uh, least of which multitasking, with the exception of Lacey. Lacey is the only person I know that can effectively multitask and do a really good job. Um, but as far as going back to that copy of the personality test, you know, you can use the personality test to show natural inclinations of strengths and weaknesses. Uh, and you can give those strengths away. You could, you could even talk about weaknesses if you've got specific instances. Like if they say you're going to have challenges doing this and this and this. Let's say you, you come across as being a perfectionist. And so it takes you a lot longer to get something really perfect rather than letting it be 80% right and setting it out there. And because of that, you may have missed some deadlines. So you can talk about, you know, 
I, I tend to be a perfectionist and that has actually hurt me and I've missed deadlines before. In fact, there was one time that we had a really big um, deadline that was due. It was a platform conversion and I had to get a bunch of stuff done, but I didn't delegate. And so my perfectionist tendencies made me late by about six hours and it put everybody else behind. It probably cost the, the company quite a bit of money. However, when, when I realized that that my perfectionistic tendencies was costing a company money as well as uh, my reputation, I knew that I needed to learn how to delegate and also to be comfortable with something less than perfect. So I've taken a class on it, I read a book on it, and then you can talk about that specifically. And now I'm getting better. In fact, um, in this last uh, transformation, uh, this business initiative that I was in, where we did a business transformation or a digital transformation, uh, then I was able to um, delegate a majority of my tasks and we actually got it done two weeks ahead of time. And so you could say something like that. Um, okay, so hope that answers that question. Um, we've got, okay, so what happens if you love a job you're applying for, but when they ask for your range, it happens to be more than they're offering? That happens all the time. Just understand that usually if they offer you the job, they're probably not going to take it away just because you say, well, gosh, that's, that's, um, I was actually expecting quite a bit more because I, I have made more in the past. Uh, and, and if that's the case, then you work collaboratively to get to something that you're happy with and they're happy with. So uh, one example is the gentleman this past weekend that, that got a new position on Monday. And, and he, he basically said, well, you know, we're, we're $98,000 apart. Let's talk about the different components of compensation so that we can possibly get to an upside potential that will work for me. And, and they ended up doubling his upside potential, which is awesome. So it went from a minimum of 450 to a minimum of 850. It's pretty cool. Um, so just, just work with them and just, here's one of the parts of the script that probably, you know, kept that hiring manager from saying, oh, no, 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 98,000 is way too, too far apart. If you say, but I'm willing to work with you to make it work for both of us. I, I love the company. The position is an absolute perfect position for me. It's just that we're a little far apart on compensation. So I'd like to talk that over with you. Can, can we have a conversation to go through those points one by one? That's what you want to, that's what you want to actually do. Um, another question. I've got, uh, three questions. So what were the star and soar abbreviations? Sure. The STAR format is the way to answer behavioral questions. It is a generally accepted format. Uh, pretty much every large company uses it. And behavioral questions are, tell me about a time when, and then they, they, that you disagreed with a supervisor, you know, and I'll tell you, by the time you get to like a, a vice president position, they're not going to ask you behavioral questions anymore. What they want to know is how, what kind of experience do you have? And is it relevant to what I need? And then they, they are okay stating what their challenges are, what they've got to overcome, what their obstacles are. And, um, and then make yourself highly relevant to that. Once they see you as the answer, they will pay more to get you because people pay more for experts as they are perceived as an expert. People pay more for um, the solution to their problems. People will pay more for that than just a winning candidate. If you're a winning candidate in an open hiring process, you may get you know the bottom range. But if you're the true end-all be-all solution to every problem they have, you're up here. You're, you're gonna get a much higher compensation. Um, Okay, then regarding strengths, do you recommend using the strengths identified via strength finders, self-assessment survey, or are they too abstract? Ah, <sighs> you know, I have toyed with that. When that first came out, I actually started um, giving that test to my clients just to see, okay, let's, let's kind of look at their strengths from a different um, aspect. Uh, and I found that we still went back to um, the old way of doing things, which is really coming up with those three core strengths, our own. And that way it is relevant to the position that you're going for. If you're going for a certain position and you're interviewing, you want to explain the three core strengths that are most relevant, that you have authentically, that are most closely tied with the, the job that you're applying for and that you're talking with a hiring manager for. Um, and then 
where to find relevant positions if not on job boards. Oh boy, that's, it's called the hidden job market or the unadvertised job market. And it's basically where, uh, and this is the way that small to mid-sized companies, and by small to mid-sized, just to let you know, small is about 10 million to 50 million, maybe 10 million to 100 million in annual revenue. Um, I usually consider as far as the size, as far as people goes, if it's a small company, it's like 200 to 1,000 people. And I say this because there are a lot of people on this um, this live stream that are probably watching and they're in a company that's over 10,000 people. So they don't know what small is or what medium is. Um, and then there are people that have not worked for anything but startups all of their life. So for them, you know, 100 million is huge, huge. So I usually think of small business as being 10 to 100 million, uh, 10 to 50 million seems to be the sweet spot as far as hiring and creating jobs, job creation. Uh, however, uh, when we work with someone, for instance, in a $23 billion company, it's really tough for them to see a small business as anything um, less than a billion. I mean, it's, it's they're like, yeah, I could go with a really small business, like a billion. And, and so just make sure that we're talking about the same thing when we say small to medium. Medium size or mid cap is $250 million to $500 million. I like to go like $100 million to $500 million as far as mid size. And then $500 million and above is considered large capitalization or large cap funds. So I, so I, I said funds. That's actually back from when I was working in American Century Investments. Um, so it's not on the job boards. It is using, this is the way that I've found that it works best. You can source the right people in a lot of different ways. Um, you can use LinkedIn to source. I recommend strongly that you use Sales Navigator, which is a, um, it's a subscription on LinkedIn and it gives you 24 filters. But using the 24 filters is a conversation for another day because it, there's a lot of nuances that you have to know in order to make that happen correctly. Uh, for instance, you don't want to get a lot of false positives. What I mean by that is anyone that you are um, applying to that um, is not in the position to have a budget to hire you or the hiring authority to create a position for you. So if that doesn't exist, you're not gonna get a position created that is outside of the open job market. So what you need to do is just contact the right person and then um, follow up with a call to action, basically letting them know that you're confidentially starting to explore other opportunities. You'd love, the, um, you'd love to talk with them about what problems they're seeing. You could even make an assumption on the problems and put that in there. Um, okay, something, or can you share something I can do to be able to go from director to C-suite? Yes, um, first of all, you can start putting the the C-suite name of the job title up at the top of your, um, at the top of your resume. So that when you send a resume in there, they know what job you're going after. And so um, that will depend on the size company. A lot of our clients go from the really large companies to a mid-sized company or smaller. That's how, and, and here's the thing, when I say that, that we're able to get $112,000 more on average, first of all, understand that um, I can't guarantee that that's going to be the case for every single person going forward. That's been the case in 2020, uh, and, and it's held true in uh, 2021 as well. But um, just, just know that there are so many factors of which are outside of our control that I can't say, I can't guarantee to you that I'm going to make you $100,000 more. Um, but if you're wanting to go from director to C-suite, you have to really think about your audience when you're putting your resume together. And that's something we really haven't talked about. In branding, you always want to make sure you're talking to the right audience. If you want to be on the C-suite, you're talking to the CEO. So you want to talk in general business terms versus functional terms. And here's what I mean by that. If you're in finance, don't overload them with too many financial pieces like jargon that they're not going to understand. Now, yeah, they could probably keep up with you if they're the CEO, especially if they're the owner of the business, the founder of the business. Uh, but just like if you're in technology, for instance, if you're talking to a CEO, you can't talk about I, I know ITIL, I know this, I know that. It's not the languages. It's not the, it, it's, 
you're not going to code. It's, it's how much money can you save the company? How can you turn IT from a cost center to a profit center? How can you make money back? If I give you a large budget, how can you make the company more than that budget? That's what you want to show is the cost savings you've been able to do through business transformation, the increase in maybe customer self-service that you were able to do from digital transformation. So there's a lot that can happen there. Um, but you want to keep your audience in mind. If I were to give you one piece of advice when you're talking to the C-suite, if you're talking to a CEO, talk in terms that a CEO will understand, not in terms of the function that you do. Also, I, I like the one-page functional resume because it will get a three to four times better response rate than a traditional chronological. If you need a copy of that, you can email any of us and we can give you a copy or you can go to the website and it's a uh, careerresumeconsulting.com and you can sign up for um, a whole, I think it's a five pack of resumes of different functions. So you can see what it's like if they're in the C-suite in marketing and finance and IT and operations, uh, sales, mark, that kind of thing. So um, that's the, the last question that I've got on here. And uh, I want to thank you. I know that we're going just a couple minutes over. It's, it's four minutes after. So, um, let me see. I'm going to look at the chat very quickly because I haven't really looked at it. Wow. All right. Excellent. So I'm going to look through. Uh, I know that I, I actually I filled it with with only 19 slides. I, I think we did a pretty good job. You got a lot of information today. So answer or ask me any other questions that you've got before the end of this. And um, let's go ahead and um, I'm going to uh, take away Brian. And let's get you, and uh, Lacey, can you go ahead and, and make, the, um, uh, make the live stream available? There we go. So I just made, I just shared the uh, how to prepare for an interview in under 20 minutes. And I know we took an hour to, to describe it to you, but I really think that those five questions, if you spend 20 minutes coming up with the answers, you are gonna be so much more prepared because you're gonna know the stories that you're gonna tell. You know the questions you're going to ask. You know, I want you to wrap it up. You can wrap it up with, do you have everything you need in order to make a decision as to whether I'm a great fit for the team or a great fit for the leadership team? So you say something like that. And when they say yes, it gives them the opportunity to say yes to you, which is actually a good thing. If you know anything about sales, you want somebody to say yes as many times as possible in a conversation. That They're more likely to hire you if they say yes six times, I think. Um, so, so that's something if you have, um, I'm going to look at the chat again. If you have any questions, please put them down and uh, I'd be happy to answer them later via email. And also I know that a lot of you have submitted a lot of questions when you signed up. So I've got a ton of those and I'm going to use those questions to build the topic for the next two weeks. So we do this every other week. And, um, and so I will, I will see you in a couple of weeks. Again, any questions, put them down and I'd be happy to um, have someone contact you with the answer or contact you myself. Uh, I hope this has helped you today. I hope this has served you today. Uh, and uh, I really appreciate uh, your attendance and staying until the very end, even after. And uh, I will see you, I guess, in a couple of weeks. Looking forward to it. If there's a topic that you would like us to talk about, put it down. Suggest a topic whatever it is. So if you'd like us to cover a certain topic, let me know because I'm building out the, um, the program for the, the summertime. I want to know what I'm going to be talking about every other week. So let me know what you would like me to talk about and I can, I can pick um, from those. All right. Okay. Have a wonderful Easter, a very blessed Easter and a very blessed Good Friday. Thank you very much. Even if you're on off of work, I really appreciate that you're taking the time to watch today and uh, I will see you in a couple of weeks. All right. Okay. I will leave this open for uh, just uh, about five minutes so that you can continue to put down something in the chat and then uh, I will answer that later. I look at those every single Friday afternoon. Okay. Talk to you soon. Thank you. Bye.